What was so exciting about mounting our first solo exhibition with Johnny Swing was that we had the opportunity for the first time since we opened up our new building here at White Street in New York to do a archival presentation of a living artist. And we are here on the mezzanine in outside our library and archives in a special exhibition space that we dedicate to showing periodicals, period documents, clippings, drawings, and other archival material like that. Johnny, I see your entire history of an artist um, from you just getting out of college right up to the uh, second decade of the 21st century outlined in front of us. Why don't you take us through that? Uh, I'd love to. These uh, pictures here are from uh, my early time in New York when I first moved to New York in 1984. I had a one person show in October of the year I moved there at a gallery called the St. Mark's Gallery. I think this picture is actually from my second one person show there. Um, these are invitations from other shows I had at St. Mark's. This was actually my first show. Um, this was a wax sculpture about six or seven inches tall, but I had obviously some visions of grandeur, making sculptures big enough I could lean against. I like the little boot. I had been in a motorcycle accident where I was in a coma. You can see the little boot that I had to wear. I was in a cast for two years. Um, going around, I showed in the St. Mark's Gallery for about from 84 to 87. In 1986, I got access to a gas station to make a sculpture studio out of it. It was on the corner of 2nd Street and Avenue B. And this is pretty much the first couple days we arrived. Uh, in the end, our, our studio was uh, dirt floored, heated with a wood stove, and the roof was made out of doors that we got out of a dumpster. Um, this is a really interesting shot where this is the Rivington School, which was another sculpture garden, which I was one of the first artists to drag. I was actually the first artist to bring a piece of metal there and start it. Um, I didn't stay with that project very long because it was a bit more anarchistic than I was expecting. You know, really, if you build something, it was almost a structure for somebody else to build something on top of. I mean, it had a great energy and it was a lot of fun and it was a good piece and it was really positive. It just wasn't sort of the way my mind was working at the time. And so I left that project pretty early on, but I like the energy of it. And I stuck with this project of the gas station, which ended up becoming my studio. These pictures are from my time at the gas station, which was about uh, 86 to 91 or two. Um, we were asked by the man that had the lease on the gas station, which was actually a performing garage. It was also a bar. Our studio was off to the back side, but he asked us to make a fence around it. And I was sharing a studio with a guy named Linus Garagio at the time. Um, we were gonna work on the fence together, but he got a commission in Japan the week that we were building the fence. And so the fence just went up and it was mostly found objects, but I still managed to get some um, sort of kinetic energy into it. You know, with visual with these doors were put on an angle and back in here, there was some 55 gallon drums that sort of looked like they were like flowing through space. Um, this piece here, this um, rim inside of a fan housing was on a spring and you, you know that moved around. There was a lot of really positive energy in the space. Um, one of the fun stories was trying to get, somebody gave us a car, you know, you know what the term of giving you a car back then is, they probably just didn't want to junk it, you know, it was more work to junk it. But what, the trick was finding somebody to help us tip it up on its nose. Um, I was, I, I had, my car break down and the guy that towed me didn't charge me and I was like well if he didn't charge me for that maybe he won't charge me to come help me tip this car up in the East Village so I went back up into Harlem and found the guy and he's like yeah sure I'd definitely come down so we got a tow truck to actually like tip this car up on its nose um, this is a really nice article about that project fun funny to, you know I thought, thought if I dressed up in one of my father's suits I would look good in the picture but it was a really really great studio it had had a it was, the, it was one of the craziest times of my life. I mean, you'd be out there welding and people would be throwing bottles from roofs down at you, to, you know, because you're making bright light at one or two in the morning whenever you, we were working. Um, we were bolting sculptures on no parking signposts at the time. That was really, you know, positive. And I guess 
you know, it, it embedded in me that if I wanted to make art or wanted to make things and share them, it was sort of my responsibility to figure out how to get them to the audience, how to, you know, that people weren't always gonna come to me offering me of a way to share this work. You know, I was in a lot of group shows, but, you know, this space really quickly became full of work. I mean, there's pictures of this studio later in time where, you know, there's no, there's no ground surface. It's just like everything just kept getting fuller and fuller. Um, and the aesthetic sort of started to get a little watered down at that point. Um, these pictures are from as, as time started going on and I, I was maturing in some ways. Um, these, this article here in New York Magazine was about the Street Sign Sculpture Project that we were doing and it led to us being hired to do the lobby of a building in Queens, which was, the building itself was 1.1 million square feet, but the lobby we were doing was 18,000 square feet. Um, the developer was serious enough that he went on to do the Chelsea Market, you know, so he was sort of on the right track to start from. The project ended up in a federal lawsuit. We were the first artist to test the Visual Artist Rights Act, which says you can't destroy, alter, and mutilate an artist's work in their lifetime. And that shined the most light on it. But interestingly enough, during the project at one point, the New York Times wanted to do an article on it, and they sent a photographer out uh, to, to do a piece on the project and ended up taking 37 rolls of film. I mean, it was that big of a project. It was walls, floors, ceiling. This picture right here is of the inside of an elevator. Just it's like a completely organic shape that was made that you know and hundreds and hundreds of people use the elevator every day it wasn't like this was not you know it wasn't necessarily an art project it was really you know something to, to bring life to this building that really had become cavernous and antiquated this is the, this is the a picture of our entranceway to our workshop sort of uh, it almost was like a pregnant belly and you know the, the reason for that was just that it was just billowing with ideas. It was just, you know, the, the doors would open and the stuff would just flow out. Um, come, come heading towards my time in Vermont here, we go from, you know, the project in Queens, which ended and then uh, it forced me to evaluate what I really wanted in life and what I was enjoying about my work. And that's the transition from installation art to making furniture. Really right up to present. This is sort of where my life is at. Um, this was sort of the turning point in my career when the work went from, you know, a few sales of furniture to where it was clearly established as a product that people loved and wanted, even on an open market. Um, this is one of my favorite pictures in an article. You know, it's really authentic. You know, that's a, an assistant just took a picture of me at work. That's what it looks like. That's what I'm doing when I'm wearing my proper clothes to not catch on fire, which I occasionally do catch on fire. And uh, we'll end with one of my favorite stories, which is um, my girlfriend in the past. You know, her favorite thing is she used to like to say is she always wanted to date a centerfold model. So <laughs> made her dreams come true, and I was happy to do that. So Johnny, your personal archives have press clippings and photos and you know newspaper correspondence gallery invites, all these other things. And today, it's easy for us to go over that wall and treasure these things that happened 10, 20, 30 years ago. But back then, what drove you to start collecting this material? Um, I collected the material because, I, wow, I, I, I can't even think of like, I can't think of a non-narcissistic answer to that. Uh, it had my picture on it, I, you know, like, I look good in that picture. I, I can't think of why, I mean, I suppose that, you know, at some point I was like thinking that it would be fun to, fun to see the evolution of, of you know, my, my mother was a painter, you know, and it was, it, you know, I certainly know that she kept articles that were written about her and, you know, uh, my father wrote articles for magazines that, you know, my grandfather was a news broadcaster. I don't know, maybe, maybe, collecting you know a lot of people collect newspapers that seems like a logical step to collect newspapers about your you know if you're gonna collect newspapers it might as well be about yourself i'm not i i um the fact the fact that they managed to travel with me from you know one loft to another loft from one marriage to another marriage from you know one lifestyle to another lifestyle you know to not 
to not get moldy or rotten or, you know, get eaten by mice or pissed on by cats or, you know, eaten by goats. You know, it's, just a, it's sort of like odd that, you know, enough of this has survived healthfully. So it's, that's, you know, it's, it's so, so much fun to finally share it with you. They, it was before it was shared with you. Take note, it wasn't like four different laundry baskets and three different trailers and, you know, attics. It was sort of, you know, I was like, where's that basket? Oh, where's that box? Or, you know, like, you know, I, I, it took a really great studio assistant I had to sort of be patient and sift through it. And I think we had in the end four, two, you know, four by eight foot sheet plywood tables set up where just things just got laid out and duplicates were put in duplicate envelopes and things were dated and questions were asked and I was working on other projects, but it, it was a, you know, it was about me, so it was easy to do. You know, there, there's no good answer to this question. There really isn't. It's, it's not like, oh, I was really thinking ahead back then. No, just. No, but I think it is a good answer. And I think the first clipping, at least, that I found going over your material is the exhibition you did with your mother. So it does make sense that you already knew that artists keep these things and it's important to look back and... You know, and, and I guess I'm really proud. Like, you know, I was proud of that show with my mother. And I'm proud of every show I've done. You know, I'm never, I never was I was like, oh, I shouldn't have done that show. You know, it's like, it was like, holy shit, you know, I did that show. You know, it was like, you know, I have memories of, you know, this one show I did in East Village where I was up for like 68 hours straight, before, you know, when I did it. And like, I look at the smile on my face and it looks like I was tripping. I mean, I just like, it's like this, you know, so the pace that I'm like, you know, like I just remember being tired. You know, I was like, I couldn't do anything but this. You know, it's just, you know, you look back and you want to have the memories and, and almost the, the newspaper clippings are the most objective memories because they're not necessarily my memories. They're sort of how they've been, you know, this has been realized by other people. So, you know, a, a sort of more healthy way to remember some things. And how long ago was it that you organized your archives? Just this spring. Just this, you know, um, I guess it was the beginning of COVID when, when I hired a new assistant and she showed potential for a lot more than welding and she needed some work at home. And I was like, hey, here's a project. <laughs> I showed it to her and, you know, she rolled her eyes a little bit, but she bit into it. Just, you know, she came back, you know, with some questions. But, you know, I think I bought like four boxes of mineral envelopes in varying sizes and everything came back and ordered numbered categories She's shout out to michelle yeah shout out to michelle <laughs> and how do you feel about viewing this specific selection that you pulled for the exhibition because obviously you had hundreds of items i think she scanned over two thousand items um I, I love it it's a it's a it, it is a you know seeing it together it seems like um a really logical chronography of my career I mean if I was gonna you know if I was if I was given the option to pull out you know that looks like about 25 items you know maybe 30. 35 I think yeah but still yeah it, I, I think it's I think it's a healthy description you know and, it, and it's and it's also nice to see what you know somebody else picks I, you know sort of like I was like oh well if she wanted invites you know maybe I could have made sure I found all the invites you know there's but you know invites are such a good you know they're they're over when an invite happens right in the first time you know when it when you know like an invite for this show is not going to seem that interesting but an invite from back in 1984 like you know what am i dressed like you know i, I see i still have a bad leg from being in traction you know i just uh you know you're like oh you know look i have a nice smile on my face i must have you know maybe i was happier back then than i thought i was you know so it's you know it it, it seems healthy and how do you think that these materials help the public understand your work I think the materials are really, um, they, they add legitimacy. I mean, I have a ton of stories, but I mean, sort of, you know, stories without proof are just good stories. I and mean, this is, you know, those, those pictures tell stories. I mean, there's, there's one picture in there that lists my name as Johnny Days. I mean, like how, how funny they didn't even like actually check to find out what my real name was. And, and they gave me another cool name. They're like, oh, you had a cool last name, you know, um, the, the, they're all, they're all really nice versions of the truth. And that's, that's sort of, you know, what's fun for me.